19th of June 2017, which is the Indy Collective Trust. To a very large extent, the statement of purpose, more or less, it, it, it reads future, or it's a prospective statement in terms of what is it that an organization wishes to achieve, and how does it wish to go about achieving that particular objective. But rarely does the statement of purpose or the vision statement tell you what led to the constitution of that organization, what led to the origins of the organization. To a very large extent, my own personal journey as an engineer turned litigator has a lot to do with the founding of the Indic Collective Trust. Uh, for most people who are not aware of it, two weeks ago we were in the news because uh, former uh, Vice President Mr. Hamid Ansari made references to Indic Collective Trust, but of course they were not charitable and this was anticipated. And this was for a good reason and we wanted such references for the simple reason that our very job was to provoke a certain discussion, our very job was to turn the course of public discourse in a certain direction. So I think in the short span of time that we have existed, we've achieved that particular objective. But coming back to my own personal journey, uh, until 2006 or perhaps December 2005, I was a mechanical engineer who couldn't become an aerospace uh, engineer in his undergraduation and who wanted to apply for aerospace engineering in his master's because two people that I have venerated as far as the, as, as the field of aerospace engineering goes is uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam and Werner von Braun, who is known as the father of the V2 rockets and subsequently the father of NASA, of course. This was my intention. In December 2005, something happened. I went to IIT Kharagpur to present a paper in the industrial engineering department and uh, the then uh, director of IIT Kharagpur, Dr. Shishir Dubey, was introducing a certain program known as the LLB with specialization in intellectual property rights. And this was supposed to be inaugurated or it, it was supposed to make its debut in 2006. That's when suddenly I started thinking and there was a reason I started thinking. While I did opt for engineering out of choice, while I became an engineer out of choice, I realized that I wanted to be in a profession that allows me to comment on public discourse with intelligence, with information, and with the tools I need to make an impact. So from an engineering standpoint, there were two options. Either I had to opt for civil services or I had to opt for law. Having seen how the bureaucracy functions, I must say it's perhaps the most suffocating and stifling atmosphere for a self-respecting uh, self individual to be a part of. Uh, the judiciary offers a lot more scope for you to be able to make a difference from being within the system, you can challenge the system, you understand how the system works. So for me, the shortest point between my position then as an engineer to public life was law. This is what I could understand at that point of time and therefore I made the choice. But since I came from a family which straddled the thin red line between the low middle class family and the middle class family, law was certainly not an option. There was immense resistance. Like most families from Southern India, not South India, there was immense resistance. I had to convince, a lot of my relatives had to speak to my parents to convince them that this was a good choice. And that most people from engineering and the medicine background were the people who opted for law, at least in advanced jurisdictions such as the United Kingdom in Europe or in, in United States. So like India listens to Western powers, Indian parents listen to Western relatives or relatives in the West. So somehow they managed to convince my parents that this was a good choice. And fortunately, since the LLB program had a connection to intellectual property and therefore some tenuous connection to technology and science, I managed to justify the choice to my parents. Of course, with huge suspicion that perhaps I was, I was on drugs, I was, I was coking or doping. And my choice of friends was also questioned. But I said, no, this is a choice. And don't worry, I will ultimately be a part of engineering, uh, the engineering ecosystem. In fact, I'm moving up the value chain is more or less how I justified it to my parents. But all along, I was clear that I wanted to get into litigation. For the simple reason that we had had a tryst with litigation and importantly I realized that slowly the course of public discourse was moving from the bad to the worst to the worst. And, and, and perhaps it, I, I realized that it was only because of paucity of articulate voices who could present a certain standpoint, an indic standpoint with information, with confidence and with the ability to break down a, con a complex concept in, in lucid terms. Because in campuses during my time, I think from 2002 to 2009, this was perhaps the worst period for anyone who holds a right of center point of view or an indic standpoint. It was getting progressively worse to the extent that you could face social boycott, ostracization, 
holding such a viewpoint was more or less politically incorrect. And I wanted to make a difference to that particular discourse. And therefore, I chose law. The other reason that I chose law is I realized that when you try and make an argument in a court of law, you have to marshal facts, you have to apply it within a certain legal framework, and you have to make this case within a span of about 20 to 25 minutes. That's more or less the attention span, or that's more or less the time that you get in a court of law. And if I have to do all of this, I need to be absolutely sure of how the system functions, I need to be sure of how the subject functions, I need to be sure of what I want. And, and therefore, the training as a lawyer more or less changed my internal wiring as an engineer. And I can say this with a certain amount of responsibility, that most engineers come with a huge ego. Or most engineers or people from the science stream come, from a, come with a huge ego, that perhaps their IQ levels are better. This was more or less my belief as well when I finished engineering. But when I finished law, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I had to change my views. For the simple reason that the wiring of a lawyer is extremely different. It's a bit teda for all practical purposes. And that is important because it helps you think out of the box. And considering the role that I had cut out for myself and considering the goal that I had cut out for myself, I wanted a certain skill set that taught me how the system functions and also how to challenge the system. So I couldn't think of a better option than law. Why is this important? My personal journey is singularly responsible for the Indic Collective Trust opting for the legal way. But the topic is titled Indic Renaissance, the legal way. I've explained why we chose law. What is it about the Indic Renaissance that we are pushing for? What is the agenda? Are we connected to someone? Is somebody pushing us? Has somebody helped set us up? These are questions that typically arise in most people's minds. So let me answer that question. In 2010, the Ram Janum Bhumi judgment was delivered by the Allahabad High Court. Subsequent to the judgment, a slew of articles were written in most mainstream publications, running down the judgment as one which was entirely based on faith, running down the judgment which was based entirely on myth, without a shred of fact, without a shred of historical evidence, without a shred of archaeological evidence. As someone who's currently part of the team which represents the Ram Janam Bhumi before the, Madras, before the Supreme Court, I'm, I can say this with a certain degree of confidence, that 4,308 pages of judgment is not based on myth. It's based on immense evidence, historical evidence, going back to 500 centuries, 500 years ago. Then I asked myself, if this is the reality, why is it that this reality has not percolated down to the common reader? Why is it that people don't seem to understand that there is a semblance of truth, there is more than an element of truth, there is more than a modicum of truth as far as the facts are concerned? The answer is narrative building. The answer is packaging. The answer is messaging. And I realized that in order for you to be able to package or in order for you to be able to shape the narrative, you need to be able to understand the facts in the first place and you need to have the ability or the skill set to present it. And more importantly, a court of law requires you to marshal yourself in such a way that you pass muster on, the, on, the, on perhaps the most stringent annuals of evidence. Therefore, if today I have to make a statement that there was indeed a temple there, and that there was indeed a place of worship which is associated with a certain community, and it has been there for at least 800 years, I at least have a judgment to support me. The pen is mightier than the sword, but the judge's pen is mightier than anybody else's pen. That's more or less my belief. Therefore, I decided that if we have to make a difference to the manner in which public discourse is conducted, then the only way of going about it is to adopt the legal approach. India has had a history of, of, of trying to evolve a national discourse based on religious nationalism, on cultural nationalism, but there are very few people who have actually hit the nail on the head, which is that Civilizational nationalism makes a lot more sense as far as India is concerned because it allows you to encompass within its basket a host of ideas which seem contradictory to most outsiders. So civilizational nationalism had to be adopted as far as we are concerned to make sure that our message is, is as broad as possible, it gets as wide an audience as possible. But then to most people of this generation or even my generation, such a talk is mostly boring. You say, what is the point? What is the point of all this discussion? Therefore, this concept or this complex idea of civilizational nationalism had to be packaged in an idiom that most people understand today, which is 
secularism, democracy, constitution, free speech. And I couldn't find a problem in blending both these aspects, which is civilizational cultural or civilizational nationalism within the paradigm of constitution, because it made perfect sense. After all, you have a plural secular democracy. I don't wish to use the word socialist because that was not then the original preamble. A plural secular democracy, not because somebody decided all of a sudden from 1947 to 1950, but because that's always been the impulse of this particular civilization. Free speech is something that has not come to us from the outside. It's not an imported value. This has always been the nature. Bhagavad Gita, at the end of the day, is a discussion. It is, at the end of the day, a question and answer session running to several thousand verses in hot summer. So as far as I'm concerned, these values were something that we need not be taught from anybody else. So I just wanted to make a point to the audience or to the general public that the Indic worldview or the Indic standpoint is perhaps the most harmonious standpoint within the constitutional framework, simply because it allows for divergent cultures, it allows for diverse points of view, and also it allows all these people to coexist without any particular point of view trying to suppress the other or trying to eliminate the other, saying mine is the only way, it's my way or the highway, and salvation to the heaven is only through me. That's something that we don't subscribe to, that's something that we don't, we don't, we don't necessarily encourage or promote. This is something that I wanted to package. The other thing that I realized was this. At least in my generation, we witnessed the rise of certain news channels, which drew a certain vicarious pleasure in banding and in branding the Indic world point, or, in the, uh, or branding the Indic worldview. And we realized that they did so in a very systematic manner by presenting the most inarticulate of voices in a particular debate wherein you come across as someone who represents a boorish standpoint, wherein you represent someone who comes across as, as holding an authoritarian viewpoint. This had to be changed. And this means it was important for us to try and revive our tradition of intellectual discourse, of the power of argumentation. And I couldn't see a better way of going about it than reviving the tradition through the Indic Collective Trust, through an argument made in law. So let me give you three examples. There is a case that's going on before the Supreme Court with respect to the right of women to enter the Sabrimala temple. It's easy to dumb down this entire discourse to women versus temples, or to patriarchy versus temples, or to stigma associated with a certain process, with a certain physiological process. But the fact of the matter is nobody has dug deep into this particular issue. Very few people have bothered to ask themselves, what is the legal manner or what is the legal framework that applies to this particular question? So, given my training as a lawyer, we decided as the Indic Collective Trust to approach the Supreme Court to present our point of view combining tradition and constitution to explain that the point of view here is not one versus the other, but it requires a balance to be struck between the rights of a certain religious institution and the rights of a certain gender. Both of them have equal rights under the law because both of them have fundamental rights. Religious institutions have fundamental rights, so do women have fundamental rights. So there was, therefore it was fundamentally a question of striking a balance between two sets of competing rights. If this discussion were to happen on television, in, uh, my, my hunch is that in nine out of 10 situations, most people would not be interested in such a nuanced discussion. That is the nature of the news cycle, that is the nature of a television discussion. And I say this with first-hand experience of having taken part in such a discussion on NDTV, where I realized that when I tried to make this point of view, and I clearly said that you have to discuss both, and you have to try and understand how do you balance one right over the other, or one interest over the other, that point of view never found traction at all. The problem is not that people are not willing to understand it. I don't think there's a problem with the intelligence of the mass. I don't think there is a problem with the intelligence or the IQ of people in general. But the problem is with the people who are interested in pushing a certain agenda. And that's one of the reasons that we decided to come out with an institutional response. And that institutional response took the shape of the Indic Collective Trust. As on date, we have about three or four pet peeves which are close to our heart and which we are which we are in the process of pursuing in, in, a, in a constitutional manner. One 
is the issue of freeing temples and Hindu religious institutions or Indic religious institutions from the clutches of state control because that is the only batch of institutions which is under state control. No other institution of any other community is under state control. For people who spout and spew or pontificate on secularism and separation of the church from the state or separation of a religious institution from the state, it is surprising that these institutions are under state control, at least for the better part of the southern institutions in, in most of the five southern states, they are under state control. At least in one state, 39,000 religious institutions in Tamil Nadu are under state control, and they have been since 1927. So that is one issue that we have chosen to focus on. The second issue that we have chosen to focus on is a sensitive issue of demographic inversion. A sensitive issue which requires us to take cognizance of illegal immigration which is happening in the Northeast and in all parts of the country, which has been happening since the 1950s, and the third wave of immigration that's happening currently through the Rohingya crisis. Now most people would want to approach this issue from a humanitarian standpoint because as Indians we have naturally bleeding hearts. And we would want to take out a candle march, perhaps to India Gate or Jantar Mantar. But then the issue is broader, the issue is larger. You have to ask yourself certain questions. Are you a human first? Fine. Being a human, does it divorce you from your responsibility as an Indian? Whose interests are you supposed to look out for? Are there no lessons from history that you're required to draw? Are there no lessons in recorded history in the last 50 years that you're required to draw? These are questions that we wanted to address. So that's the third aspect, second aspect. The third aspect that we have decided to focus on is recalibrating the Right to Education Act. Unfortunately or fortunately, that legislation is couched in a certain manner, which makes anyone who questions that legislation or its premise sound like an elitist bigot. Therefore, we wanted to address this in as articulate a manner as possible, in as nuanced a manner as possible, because the Right to Education Act targets only institutions of a certain community or a certain group, and casts the onus entirely on one particular community to take the responsibility of educating everyone. So these are the issues that we've chosen to focus. In the last one year, one year of our constitution or one year of our existence, we have achieved a fair amount of success. But the goal is not just legal success in a legal forum. The idea is to inculcate within youngsters the ability to understand diverse standpoints and not just flow with the narrative like a blind herd of sheep or, or a blind flock of sheep. And importantly, inculcate among themselves an ability to ask the right questions, the ability to research further, and especially as far as lawyers are concerned, apply all these arguments primarily as a lawyer within the framework of the law, as opposed to being swayed by activist notions. So this is more or less the journey that we have traversed so far, and we hope that in the coming years, we will change the narrative where today our oppressors are lionized and we are Zionized. Hopefully that should not be the case in the next 15 years. Thank you.